Do you want to get started homesteading, but you don't think you have enough land? Or maybe you don't think you have enough time because you work a full-time job and have kids. Well, on today's episode, we speak with guest Jess Robison of Acton Food Forest, and she's going to tell us about her homesteading journey and how she overcame those things and started homesteading. And she has some great advice for you to get started, too. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race I want to flee, my world I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. Well, Jess, welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm glad you decided to come on and tell us about your uh, your journey into homesteading and some of the things you're doing. Sounds like you're really involved with permaculture, food forests, and and you're doing it on a pretty small property. And it sounds like you've even expanded that into some business uh, you're doing, which we'll talk about later. I hope, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear all about it. I mean, how'd you get how'd you get into homesteading? Sure, I mean it. It started with when we moved to this house and I wanted to plant some apple trees and I knew I didn't want to, you know, this was about seven years ago. I didn't really know as much as I do now about things, but I knew that um, apple trees are typically required a lot of sprays and things like that. And I didn't want that, right? I didn't, A, like just the work around it, but B, I didn't want that for my yard or for my kids to be adjusting or anything like that. And so um, I called my aunt who lives in Portland, Oregon, who has even less land than me. And she was like, you know, I think you should look into this thing called permaculture. And she gave me like the name of like a Google listserv. And um, I think that's actually how I found out about your podcast potentially. Um, that was and, that long ago, probably. Yeah. I started about then. Yeah. 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 Um, and it was sort of like that kind of like lit, uh, lit a wick, right? Because it was like, well, if I want to have apple trees, then I also probably need to plant some comfrey and I also need some pollinator. <laughs> I need some like good mulch inputs and like, you know, it's just like every year kind of add to it. Um, and I always loved gardening um, when I was in college. So I went to art school and my science and math requirement, you could take like a typical math science require like mm-hmm. class or um, they had plant morphology and plant illustration classes. Oh, wow. And I was like, that sounds a lot more cool than taking like Earth Science 101. Yeah. So, yeah. So I took, I believe, three of those classes that filled my requirement. And so it was in Brooklyn at um, Pratt Institute. And the lead horticulturist from Brooklyn Botanic Garden would bring in samples and you would learn about like, particular type of plant so like rhizomes or something like that he'd bring in samples and then you would we would illustrate the samples Mm. um and that sort of kind of is where a lot of the foundation for what i started doing came from and then um we moved out of i moved out of brooklyn and into the boston area and i had uh an italian landlord and he used an empty parking spot to grow heirloom tomatoes wow and Yeah. And uh, I had my first like homegrown heirloom tomato and I was like, what is this? It's always the tomatoes. It's always the tomatoes. <laughs> I was going to say it's always the tomatoes. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of where that's a little bit of the background of how everything started. But yeah. So you have uh, two kids. I have two kids. Yep. They're yeah. four and seven. Yeah. Oh, wow. So they're really uh, getting to experience the homestead life, really. I mean, as far as uh, gardening and, and uh, do you have animals as well? I, I have some chickens and I have okay. a dog um, and some worms. <laughs> um, yeah, we have eight chickens. I think we might be expanding that if I can convince yeah. my husband to get put a little carpentry job uh, together for for the spring. But yeah, that's that's all that we can really have on our size um, piece of land. So in and, in the town I'm in, you need two acres to have anything other than chickens and ducks. How, how much land do you have? I have, I believe it's exactly 0.83 acres. That's a, um, for for a suburban area, that's a fairly large slot, really. Yeah, half of it's yeah. wooded. Um, 
and yeah, about half of it's wooded and we're outside the city. So we're about 20 mm-hmm. miles west of Boston. Okay. So it's considered a, it's a rural suburb, but it's mm-hmm. still, I mean, for a Northeast suburb, it's, you know, it's a typical yeah. Northeast suburb. Uh, so how many chickens did you say you had? Eight. Hey, is there a limit? They like, is there a limit? How many they let you have? I think it's like 40 and then you need a breeder. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. I don't think. Yeah. You're probably yeah, getting that We're many. a right to farm. We're a right to farm town. So yeah, it's 40. Yeah. And then you can have more. You just need a can, breeder's license. Can you have, so you can't have a rooster then? You can have roosters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I don't, well. we're pretty close to our neighbors. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Uh, so we how had much... a couple of roosters and. They oh, did you? <laughs> Yeah, they can be really. Uh, they can they can bother neighbors if if, if you're well, in the neighborhood. You know, I it they were they were younger. We it was the first um, the first flock I got. I got three silkies in there because I really wanted some silkies, mm-hmm. and they're really hard to gender, right? So I, that's why I got three. Everyone was like, "Oh, they're kind of hard. Like they're not hardy chicks, and you might end up with some roosters." And so two of three, two out of three of them were roosters. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they, they did actually end up going to like a breeding farm. Um, mm-hmm. so wow. I, I don't know what they're up to these days, but they didn't get put into stew. <laughs> so you're doing, I mean, what you're growing like a food forest there. I mean, you, you're doing food forest and gardens. I mean, so uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, first of all, how'd you get into food forest? I mean, there's just the permaculture pursuits kind of took you down that path or. Yeah. And you know, the, um, it's sort of a mix of food forest and um, like typical um, like annual veggie garden. And I think if you look at um, the progression of land, right. I don't remember. um, It was a permaculture documentary was talking about like how land is formed and how you start with annuals and eventually work your like land will eventually work its way up from Mm -hmm. barren land to Savannah, to shrubs, to mature trees. And so that's sort of how I look at the yard too. So I might grow an area of annual veggies until I know what I, particularly in the backyard. Um, if I don't know exactly the layout I want, I, so this year we did some straw bales um, cause I didn't feel like putting beds in. And so I was like, I'm just going to do some straw bale gardening until I really figure it out. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, okay, like half of this really needs to be orchard. So um, I've kind of been tinkering around with like how aesthetically pleasing I want the orchard to be versus functional and how I've been doing it essentially in like mini guilds. So each, yeah. each tree gets a, like its own little guild of, of partner plants. That's a great way to do it. I mean, just really figure out, take it one tree at a time. You know, some people think food forests and they think, you know, this, a forest, they think something this huge scale. Um, but really just starting with one tree and just, figuring out what works well around that tree, what's going to support the tree, what's good, what, you know, what benefit the tree is going to have to those plants. And then just start working it out from there and just take one tree at a time. And, and it just doesn't have to be that complicated or even on a scale that's just huge. And I think a lot of people get confused about that when you're talking about small space gardening, right, and I think homesteading and permaculture. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things like the examples they use and everything like that, when you're looking at different books is it's always using like a really large tree as it's, anchor tree and like that doesn't need to be the case you don't need to have a really big pecan tree or something like that yeah you can use a dwarf apple as as the Mm -hmm. tree or a dwarf pear or something like that yeah i mean and and honestly i mean i think about even something about like uh the three sisters garden i mean you have a a corn stalk that is your overstory basically of the other two Mm -hmm. support plants and that's a guild in itself and that's something that's just a tall plant and two other plants uh so yeah you're right it doesn't have to be this this large overbearing um, huge what, tree 40 or, years to get to. Yeah. 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 And that's kind of way I've done it too. just take one tree at a time, you know, and I plant a tree and sometimes I don't do anything other than just leave that tree alone for maybe a year or two. And then I just start putting some stuff around it, you know, and just start easy, you know, just real slowly kind of just building a guild around it. And, and I find it fun, relaxing, and, and it just doesn't put a lot of stress on me to, to accomplish this thing really quick and make it really big, you know, and totally. And, Plus I- yeah, it's something that, you know, if I'm like dividing chives, I go and put a clump next to each apple tree and instead of going out yeah. and buying 12 chive plants or something like that, or same thing with, you know, yeah. if I'm, it's, it's easy to kind of add as you go. And yeah, you, you mentioned Kirk Comfrey earlier, you're putting that around your trees. That's a great uh, guild plant. Yes, it's fantastic. We have a ton of it and 
I chop it a couple times a season, lay it down around the mm-hmm. plants, put it in the compost pile, um, given it to the chickens before, I made salve. It's always a very popular item at like any seed swap. I'll always have a little bit of root cuttings for people and stuff like that. So yeah. it's fantastic. As long as you get the sterile seeded kind, it's fantastic. Yes. Uh, I co-host with Rachel now and we, and she uh, made that mistake. She bought the the non-sterile kind of the, the, the regular comfrey, uh, native comfrey, and it spread everywhere. She, you know, the seed oh, spread and okay. went everywhere. And yeah, and I, I started out with a mocking 14 and, That's you know, I was yeah. real careful about On where I advice. placed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, she, she, she owns that mistake. She says, yeah, I wish I would have went with the, you know, and it's, it's set now and you can't get rid of it. Really. It's so much work to try to control that. Once it's, <laughs> you let it out of the box, it goes. Yeah. Um, you can't really fight it. I know I saw when I was in, um, a couple of years ago, I was traveling and I went to Versailles and they had this dwarf comfrey and I'm like dying to find because d- comfrey can get you know kind of yeah. kind not super tall but like three feet and this was like maybe only eight inches hmm. tall wow never found it I've been looking do you know if it was a sterile variety or if it was a I don't it wasn't hmm. I mean they have people full-time taking care of that property yeah. so if it wasn't, it's probably not a big deal because they have, you know, it's Versailles. <laughs> yeah, they can keep the keep up with the seed heads and keep them off there and control it. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's neat. Uh, now you're you're gardening. Do you have like raised beds? Or you're are you right in the ground? How, what's your garden look like? I have a mix of everything. You just kind of sounds so, like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I started. Let's see. The first garden is raised beds. It's sixteen by sixteen with like a keyhole with like a little four by four in the middle. Mm-hmm. And then um, when the pandemic hit and we had some extra time at home, we hired a brush hog to come in and clear some land that was taken over by um, Bittersweet. And which, you know, I had looked at deer, I had looked at, or not deer, I had looked at goats and I had looked at like pigs and like thinking about, you know, what's the, and then at the end of the day, the thing that made the most sense was just to hire a brush hog for three hours. Um, yeah. And he cleared about 1,500 square feet in like wow. two hours or something like that. And I that was, was like, okay, to go. wow, yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty big chunk of land. Um, and I was like, you know what? I want to make this more growing space. So we got a deer fence and put it around it. And we've just been kind of like playing with it ever since. Okay. Yeah. Sounds and like so those are all just... in ground. Oh, it's all in ground. Yeah, that's a mix of in-ground and straw bale and um, got some cattle panel back there, too, for like a tunnel. But the trellis, like beans and things over that. And I've done every I did everything over the trellis. So I did three cattle panels in a row. And so you kind of like can walk through the idea mm-hmm. is really for the kids. Right. I really yeah. wanted a like, cool space for the kids to play. And so I did beans, cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, um, butternut squash couple other varieties of squash and just kind of let everything mm-hmm. hang out. I'm not saving seeds, so it's not a big deal that I have the cucumbers with, with the other guys right. there, but yeah. Well, you work Every a full-time a job. Where, what? Yeah. You work a full-time job and do all this too. I mean, you're taking care of this garden, putting in this food forest, got a couple of kids working a full-time job and you're finding time to do all this, right? I mean, it's doing everything. Yeah. So, um, so I have a pretty flexible job. It is full time though. I work in the tech industry as a, as a, um, a user interface designer. And, um, basically the way it works is in May, I committed to myself in May. I took three days off from work. Kids went to school and I planted everything out. Um, or most things, right. I got a good chunk done and that's something that I sort of like commit to myself every year i'm going to take some time away from work to get the the garden started or like the big the big push um and then i go out usually between well now it's kind of getting dark but like between five and six i typically have the kids outside with me i'm getting some gardening done and then depending on the season depending what's going on i'll wake up before the kids and go out there Mm mm-hmm yeah i mean yeah i do kind of the same thing take a few days off work in, in the in the spring because yeah i mean that's you got a couple times of the year where it gets kind of crazy and busy i find you know the planting season's pretty gets a little hectic for a few days and then harvest there's you got that gradual harvest kind of throughout the season you know that's nice and it's casual but then you got that push you know right there when yeah, everything's kind of coming August gets nutty right yeah it gets crazy and then you're just like 
you know, maybe three or four weeks, you're just really super busy trying to, you know, put everything up in the cabinets. Cause I don't know if you do a lot of preserving, but for us, it gets pretty hectic. Well, I do some. So last yeah. year I did a lot more and I was like, you know what, this year I was sort of like, that was a ton of work mm-hmm. and I was missing out on a lot of things I wanted to be doing during that time. So although I'm going to be kicking myself this year that I won't have 40 jars of tomatoes to be working off of, mm-hmm. um, and I'll probably next year I'll can yeah. again. <laughs> but yeah. I did yeah. I, I did some pickles and some easy stuff, but I didn't do all my tomatoes. Yeah. So what, what would you say was your, your real motivation then? It sounds like putting up tons of food wasn't your real motivation for the winter or whatever. I mean, what would you say is your real motivation for wanting to homestead and permaculture and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, getting so being a good citizen of the planet was one of them. Like, I really wanted to reduce my carbon footprint. And Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer. I forget what the last line in the Lorax is, but it's essentially like if everyone works a little bit harder to do a little bit better. Yeah. Um, And so that's sort of that's one of the big reasons why I do it. And then I really love having local food like close to me Mm -hmm. and learning and the therapy behind it right it's just such a good stress yeah. relief i have pretty um you know working in the tech industry can bring its own, its own <laughs> stuff so um yeah. it's just i can get out there for 15 minutes and feel like i went to like a day spa afterwards yeah. um and then i do have a ton of food i love to share it but i do we have i would say even though i don't can my tomatoes we still have you know I knock off probably 70% of my groceries between May and August. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I actually just had to buy my first thing of eggs in three years because the girls are oh, yeah. Get girls are slowed down. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's like almost like a fun game to see like what things I can avoid from my shopping list. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you take it a step further. I mean, it's not that you just want to do this and take this responsibility yourself and do this yourself. But I, I see what you share and it looks like you're, you know, I think you are inspiring and motivating a lot of people to, uh, to do it as well. I mean, what's your motivation behind that? You just really want to see a lot of people. Yeah. I want to see a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it takes like a hundred people homesteading perfectly to make this work to, you know, to build community, to be lighter on the planet. I think it takes like, millions of people to do a few things imperfectly Mm -hmm. right and learn and so that's sort of why i go on why i have an instagram channel where i share everything because i think if ever you know if you can learn even just one of the examples i was talking about is even if you just grow basil right Mm -hmm. one pot of basil for the season that's probably 20 clamshells from the grocery store that you didn't have to buy that didn't have to Mm -hmm. come on a refrigerated truck be put into a plastic clamshell sit on a grocery shelf, potentially get chucked out because it had like one wilted leaf, all these things just from having one pot of basil. So if you take that and then you take that principle and then you like turn it into an acre of uh, growing vegetables, then, you know, that's, but mostly I want to show people like, A, it's not always perfect. You're always learning. You can fit in, you can fit it in, right? And if you, and I think one of the things is everyone thinks everything has to be perfect 100% of the time. And that's not true, right? We all have crop failures, (laughs) right? We all have a bunch of like unplanted seedlings hanging out in the middle of the paths and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Um, Kids who go around and throw tomatoes because you (laughs) are looking the the wrong way, whatever. Um, And so, yeah, I just want people to see that it's doable, right? You can... You can work, you can have friends, you can have kids, and you can grow a garden. And yeah, you can do it without having to add a bunch of crap to the land. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, that's kind of the reason I started doing it, too. I just want even doing this podcast, you know, it's like I just wanted people to see that it could be done. You know, you didn't have to have a 40-acre farm and, you know, you didn't, you could work your full-time job. You could do these things and still make it happen. And And I didn't know that. I remember when I first was thinking about or wanting to homestead, but here I'm, you know, on a city lot. And I was like, well, I, you can't do it here. So what am I going to do? Well, then I ran into, you know, I come across people on YouTube and places and, that were doing it and doing it well on small lots. And I'm going, well, I guess you can do it, you know? So it kind of inspired me to get me going. And this is why I started doing it. And then I see people like you doing it as well. And I just, I love that, that it's just, it just continues to spread and, 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 and motivate people. I think it's great. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting. And I think it's one of those things that's like kind of natural. It's like in a good way, addictive, right? Like you start out with one or two beds and then you're like, well, I didn't have, I didn't have room for eggplant and peppers this year. So I'll do another bed. And then you're like, Mm -hmm. oh, this looks interesting. And sort of becomes this thing where you just every year, every spring, you add a couple beds. And um, when I do consulting, one of the things, if someone's a new gardener, I say, don't do a huge garden. Let's do a plan that starts with like a couple beds. And like, I'll show you what it can look like in a couple of years, but stick with what you stick with a little bit. And then, you know, being overwhelmed isn't fun. It's going to make it not a fun hobby. So if you just add slowly and, you know, it's to the point where it's like, I don't stress out over my tomatoes. I've been growing tomatoes for 15 years. Like I, you know, Mm -hmm. if I grow 25 tomatoes, it's not, you know, I know it's inevitable that they're going to get blight and they're going to get whatever. And it just is what it is. So I can spend my energy doing other things while my tomatoes are doing their, you know, Right, right. Well, you just mentioned that you do some consulting. Let's talk a little bit about that. Do you run your business as Acton Food Forest? Is that yeah, Acton Food Forest. Yeah. So I um and I've actually scaled back a little bit. Now I'm only taking on community projects. So that was okay. one thing I was working with home with uh like homeowners or tenants, whoever, a one-on-one to get them growing um at home. And that was fun. It was just really busy and taking mm-hmm. away from my own garden. And yeah. you know, the the spring can be busy. My kids play soccer and all that good stuff. So I wanted to, you know, be around for that. So now I'm taking on less, but like things that I think take that give a good impact. So I did a school garden this year. I'm hoping Mm. to do another school garden um, next year. So I'm helping them figure out um, what they should be growing and like what the space should look like based off of what they're trying to accomplish. So for example, the school garden I worked on this year was, it was really important that kids in wheelchairs um, be able to get through the garden and feel like they're included in it, which was really interesting. I talked to some friends whose kids have disabilities and they said, you know, one of the things about ADA um, inclusive areas is a lot of times those things are on the border. And so it's like they're on the outside looking in at the rest of the garden. And so we made sure that um, anything that you could push a wheelchair up to or or have anything like that was part of the garden and not just kind of off to the side. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think Use it's just super trucks, important. By the way, if anyone's looking for a good, um, a good um, bed style for people with disabilities, the veg trucks worked out really well because you can push a wheelchair right up under it. What is that? Exactly. Veg trug. It's like a V shaped raised bed oh, Okay, on, on legs. And so because it's a V shape, the chair can go right up to it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And it I could see a lot of people, more soil than if it was flat. I could see elder people, elderly people really benefiting from something like that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. We did um we did a lot of like um really strong smelling herbs like um rosemary and things like that in there so that they could get really like full a full sense of um of the garden. Yeah. If you, did, you know, some tall grown tomatoes, they're not gonna be able to reach up there. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're doing some really worthwhile projects then. That's uh, I like that too, that you're taking on the bigger projects that you feel like are making a bigger impact. Um, because I mean, you know, the reality is most people with just a little bit of research could, can really do something in their yard. They don't, you don't always need, you know, a consultant to come in and show it. you how to plant a garden, you know, right. But it's helpful. Right. I think that it can be. That it, and so we, I did start doing like a group. I have a group online um garden club where you you know you join and you're there for may through october we meet once a month we go over what what issues might happen during the Mm -hmm. month and um you know i can work on them work with them one-on-one a little bit during the zoom meeting and things like that i think it's more people are afraid to make mistakes right that's the biggest thing i found and gardening is about making mistakes and you learn on permaculture it is you learn more from a mistake than you do from a success because you don't know what you did right necessarily, but it's pretty, you learn a lot when you're trying to figure out what went wrong. Yeah. I've learned a ton because I've made tons of mistakes. <laughs> Always. And I'm like, you know what? You don't have to keep the plant where it is. If it's not happy, then, you know, if you just learn how to transplant it and when to transplant Unless you it. you got one of them kind of plants that just doesn't want to leave like a comfrey or something. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Or mint. I think I, I think half of the reason I sold my last house was because I put mint in uh, in the ground <laughs> yeah i've got some mint like at the front part of, of the garden right beside my house and it's just it spreads into the yard it's it's actually spread into some other raised beds and i'm just constantly pulling it out and it's everywhere but right. it's Our, okay. i made 
I made the mistake. I thought, I mean, I still, it's still doing its work, but it's not. So around the border of the chicken coop, I thought it, it would be a great idea to plant a bunch of herbs that would keep, you know, the chicken that would help the chickens and keep bugs away and all this stuff. And then I thought mm-hmm. like, oh, secondly, I'd also get all these herbs. And then now I'm like, you know what I don't want to ever eat is herbs that have been growing next to a chicken coop. Yeah. But they do they eat them really well though? Will they pick uh, them? Tear no, them it's it's a lot of mint and lemon balm. They um, I'll oh. throw like I'll put the mint in their water um, when it's really mm. really hot out because that's good at, for cooling them down. Um, and they'll pick at some stuff like through, kind of through it. And if they're if they're free ranging, but for the most part, I mean, they just kind of grow and grow. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Mint's one of the. I put some in a. I built an outdoor. Uh, aquaponics tank uh with uh, an ibc tote a few years ago and i put some mint in it with some other stuff and when i decided to dismantle that aquaponics tank the roots of that mint i mean this was you know it has like i had like the lava rock for the mm-hmm. grow medium in it and it the rocks were or the uh, the roots of that mint were so intertangled around that rock i couldn't even get the rocks out i mean they were like just wrapped around every single rock like a foot yeah deep. and they, i mean like that's the problem with is it strangles stuff like yeah. i it took out a really large beautiful echinacea plant i had at my last house <sighs> Yeah, it's crazy. I, I've never it. seen anything grow, grow like that. Uh, I have a few plants like that around here that just they just will not uh, give up. I mean, they're my they're, youngest loves mint. So like he I mean, he knows not to do the not to get the stuff near the chicken coop. But like he will mm-hmm. he can he can keep it at bay because he will just sit there and chew on mint. Leaves. Oh, yeah. It's a great. I mean, it's great if you know how to really handle it and control it. But but again, that's part of permaculture. You, you observe, you plant, you observe, you 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 learn from your mistakes, you move things, you figure out what works, what doesn't work. And then you, you build on that. And uh, that's one of the things I really love about permaculture, you know, that uh, you can, you know, you, you can just kind of work with it. You know, it isn't like you do this, you know, and, and this is what you get. It, it, your situation is always different. It depends on where you live, your climate, you know, everything about it. And you got to figure it out for you. Yeah, you know? What you're trying to get out of the land too. Right. I think right. so much of it, um, I was researching how to build a swale for some, I, the back area is on an incline and I wanted to put some pear trees in there. And I was laughing because, you know, it's like one of those things where like everyone has such different reasons for why they do certain things mm-hmm. and everyone has such different backgrounds, but the thing they have in common is that they, you know, they're, they're trying to work with their land. They're trying to grow, um, grow things for their family and they're, um, trying to like, close the loop right and so i was looking i was um listening to i don't remember what youtube channel it was and the the gentleman was talking about building a swale to protect like like in terms of like earthwork because he had a military background Mm. um and he's like talking about using the swale to like you know as like a as a place to hide out if you need to protect the land (laughs) (laughs) i was like okay so we have very different reasons for needing yes that would be yeah that would be something completely different you don't hear that much talked about in the permaculture circles (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, not at all. But the guy, you know, the guy was talking. He's a part of part of what he feel makes him feel secure is like yeah. being able to, you know, defend whatever he needs to. So it was just funny. I was like, hey, this guy and I probably wouldn't get along at a bar, but that's okay. Like <laughs> I can still learn from him. That's great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of things, and that's I'm feel the same way though. I take things, I leave things, you know, because not everything applies to me, you know. But at the same time, or, or I just have different agenda, you know. It's like what I want to accomplish isn't what they want to accomplish, or how I feel about things is not exactly the same maybe my my ethics are a little different or whatever you know and right but i, I still listen to a lot of people you know even though i don't 100 percent agree with and i just try to take what i feel like fits and you know leave the rest and uh yeah it's and like then, parenting i think someone said yeah. listen to all the advice but take only what you need right yeah, like, yeah. It's always if, a- but you also don't know what you don't know and if you might actually find out that you tend to agree with them more than you think you do later because you start seeing things from a little bit different light you know oh, yeah. well, if parenting you as well before, the same yeah, say, if you asked me before i became a parent what my opinions on certain things are versus now yeah they're very different yeah yeah i was a way different parent when i was in my 20s uh, you know now that i'm <laughs> right, in my you know, 50s eat, it's like- a little different <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you're out to eat and a baby's crying and you're like, why would you bring a baby to a restaurant? And then like, you know, fast yeah. forward 10 years and you're like, I just didn't feel like cooking and you're going to have to put up with this crying baby. Yeah, yeah. And it's like I see, you know, I I, I see these homesteaders, you know, on an Instagram, which we'll talk about this in a minute, but we'll see them and and 
they'll mention, oh, you know, well, we, we went to a fast food restaurant today because whatever, and they, and they are almost apologizing for it. And I'm like, you know what? You got four small kids and you feed them 90% of the time from the homestead. You know what? If you need to go to McDonald's for a day and take a break, I'm okay with that. And I don't think you need to apologize for yeah, it. You know? Right. Exactly. As long as they know, like it's entertainment it's not nutrition and yes. you know, it's a treat yeah. then it is what it is. And it is. Yeah. And there's, and there are some that would just get kind of judgmental and say, well, you can't never, you know, and it, yeah, it's you know, whatever. I think it, you can only do things in moderation, right? Like even homestead, right. you can only homestead in moderation. Like I can't say kids were never going on a vacation again because we have a homestead. That's just <laughs> not, you know, you're never seeing your cousins unless they come here. That's not <laughs> that's not how I want to raise my family. So it's like, yeah. you know, and I I will I'll admit like I have like planned trips around seed starting time and things like that. Um, but you know, at the same time I'm making it work for my life. So yeah, I'm still yeah. starting seeds and I'm still going skiing in Colorado or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever. And, the and, and one thing's for sure, the more livestock you get, that gets tougher. Uh, livestock can definitely change that situation a little bit and you, yes. finding help yeah. to take care of animals while you're gone or, or around processing times. And yeah, there's definitely, it just depends on where you're at in the homesteading journey, but if, I think it's certain a big levels, reason why we just have eight chickens yeah. and like our neighbor, our neighbor will I'm very generous with the eggs. So they are happy to, you know, yeah, help, yeah. With, help with the chickens. And I always say like anything I have, and I think anyone who's starting with any type of livestock, like have a friend who knows a little bit more about you, a little bit more about it. And so, you know, I have a friend that if something, if I happen to be away and something happens, like I've, you know, we've arranged, like she'll call a chicken for me if it needs to happen or whatever, you know, she's, mm-hmm. so it's good to have, it's, you know, you can't, you can't totally homestead and not, to, not be part of a community because you need that community sometimes. Yeah, I agree. That's perfect. Right. Yeah, you got to have that. Uh, if you're trying to do it alone, you're going to really struggle for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you need to have some people you can reach out to if for nothing else, just to, just to stay motivated. Because I find that especially during like harvest time of the year, it's like, I get tired, you know, and it start I start thinking like, why do I do this to myself? You know, this is a lot of work. You no, know, it's then, 95 degrees out and I'm I'm yeah. cooking 30 pounds of tomatoes and then I got to go inside and heat my kitchen up and yep. But it's nice to be able to see other people going through the same struggle, knowing that it's a tough time for them too, but yet they're going to do it because they know the value of it. And just to talk with people like that, it, it keeps you going, you know, so it's important that community is even good for that, just for the, the moral support kind of to hang in there. Totally. And bouncing ideas off of too. Yes. I think that's like yes. one thing like, Hey, I'm thinking I had a friend who said, I think I want to add Guinea, Guinea um, hens to my you know she had she didn't have chickens yet and she was thinking about guinea heads and i was like mm. you know i don't know that much about them but i do know that they suck at free ranging and they're really loud loud yeah i grew up yeah. with some of those they're very and loud. they're not <laughs> supposed to be particularly nice to other poultry yeah and they got a mission to die they they look for reasons to die they look for a way <laughs> they just like it i think <laughs> right it's like they're cool looking birds i get it yeah. um so you know it's good you know, that she was like, what do you guys think? And she was asking uh, myself and another person that have chickens. And we're like, start with chickens, start mm-hmm. with chickens first, then decide. There's a reason. Like, we don't have ducks. I yeah, think I a- wanted every time I see ducks, I'm like, you know, every spring I see the ducklings and I'm like, oh man, I really want ducklings. But like, I don't want ducks. I know I want ducklings and not ducks. So yeah. There's a reason for chickens, the gateway animal for homesteaders, because, you know, it, it is one of the easier ones and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's inviting, you know, and it will make you want other animals for sure. Because you think everything, well, if this is what raising chickens, like, oh, I bet every, you know, everything else yeah, is great too. Yeah, sheep must be just as easy, uh, right? Yeah, they're, they're yeah. one of the easier ones for sure. And some, on some levels, and that even depends on where you live. I mean, if you live in a really cold climate and, you know, where or a real dusty in cl- climate or, you know, with respiratory issues and things, I mean, you can have chickens can be difficult in certain areas, you know? Yeah, no, totally. I think we, you know, we get a pretty, we're, we're not super far North. We're in Boston, but like, I still have mm-hmm. to put up a windbreak for them in the winter and deal with shoveling out the coop and stuff yeah. like that. So it, it, you know, it's not, it's easy. I always say when people ask me about chickens, super easy when it's easy. When it's hard, it's usually gross yep. and kind of hard. There's things you have to do. You have to do that aren't the most pleasant things in the world, but it's just the requirement if you're going to raise livestock, you know, yep. chickens in this case. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you, you share 
the good and the bad on Instagram, which I like. Yeah, I mean, you're showing the struggles or when things aren't perfect. And a lot of homesteaders don't do that. They want to show just the good stuff or show like it's, you know, it's the dreamy life. Like everything's perfect all the time. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to, to let people know that it ain't always like that, though. I think not only is it not always like that, but like it can't be done in a, in a, in a floral print dress. <laughs> <laughs> that's like one of the things that I was talking about. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how these people do it. And like, they, you know, they put on their, I'm like, I am wearing sweatpants. Like that's what you wear when you're, or overalls, like that's, you know, I don't, I try not to do much for the for quote unquote for the gram. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to show your failures or like the funny things that happen or, you know, yeah. they're just stuff where you're like, I don't, you know, I've, and I've asked for advice before on Instagram too. Like, Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm not sure what's going on here. And does anyone know? And like, I've gotten some really good, you know, advice, feedback, resources, all sorts of stuff. So it's been, you know, I think I've, I've gotten as much as I've given. Sure. Yeah, there's always somebody out there that knows more than you do and and have been doing it a while or you know has experience in a certain area and they can help you along and people are I that's what I love about the homesteading community they're extremely generous people I mean they're they're always yeah. eager to help and uh, and and kind of guide you along I mean very rarely do I find a person who's just like well figure it out you wanted this lifestyle get after it. you know and yeah I, only, you know, only my husband does that no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> oh no yeah, well. Uh, there might be times oh, he's when very that happens. Helpful. I'm, I'm joking, but yeah, no, I think there's <laughs> definitely everyone has been super generous with both. Like, hey, I have this. It could be as much as like you know, we have um on Facebook. There's a couple chicken communities. Sometimes you know you're like the feed store is closed and I need some blue coat or I need whatever, and people are like, come on, you know, you get people offer so much help. Um, yeah. So that's yeah, it's really nice and. Do- do you have a good network locally of people you, you uh, garden with and talk with and, or is it just pretty much online? Um, I think it's a mix of both. So mm-hmm. we have definitely some, like some mom friends from school who are super into gardening mm-hmm. and, um, and people online. So it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a good mix. I would say definitely online is where I get the most variety of, yeah. of folk where, you know, it's, I can, for the most part. Yeah. I think maybe it's like 25% local and 75% on Instagram. Yeah. I'm definitely seeing the benefits of, I mean, with me, it's been a a lot online, you know, and and I've been lately seeing the huge benefits of trying to build up local community and really get more involved on a local level, uh, helping people get garden started and, and just, you know, being there to help with, with jobs, you know, all we're putting in, you know, a food forest, can you come show us some things or a garden or, you know, putting up a greenhouse or whatever and go over and help them put it up. Or, you know, I just see um, the importance of really getting involved locally. I didn't know if you had a connections, you know, I know a lot of homesteaders that, especially today, it seems like, you know, with YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, it's like, we just throw it out there to the world and you can get lots of people that are interested but you forget kind of that, you know, you live in a community, a local community. Yeah, I think a lot of, I would say I get, I would say the majority of the people that I follow or follow me, actually, no, I follow people from all over, but like a lot of, I would say like, I interact a ton with local people who are in like Metro West um, yeah. Boston for sure. Cause they're the ones who have like similar problems are asking, you know, where did you get that grafted pear tree? You know, what, which nursery has that? Or, you know, a lot of that. Cause I think people, there's certain questions I get over and over again. I'm always happy to share. Like one is how did you get the cattle panels back to your house? <laughs> right. You didn't have a truck, yeah. right? Yeah. I would say, I don't have a truck. Okay. Um, but I know a couple places around here that will deliver. So that's always good. So that people are happy to have that. And then like a lot of times, you know, how do you get bulk compost, which I love sharing that because that means that people aren't buying plastic bags of mm, compost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like a lot of that, I think is really important. And then also just, it's like, Hey guys, I killed my loofah gore. Does anyone have any extra seedlings? And like, you know, people are happy to, happy to share. <laughs> well, okay. So let's just, I, I think that a lot of the confusion maybe gets around small spaces. Um, mm-hmm. It's what I, I do a lot of, obviously small spaces are what I'm dealing with. You know, we have, I did buy a second, like the property right next to us. We still only have like a quarter acre and, mm-hmm. and we're doing a ton on a quarter acre, but awesome. um, you're doing a lot. You have, you know, 
less than an acre uh, and a lot less than that that you're actually using for homesteading and mm-hmm. your permaculture. Um, there's a lot of people in our situation. I would say the majority of people in our situation similar to ours where they have just a small little lot, you know, in a, in they a don't have farm, right? Yeah. And, and I think, I think a lot of people, maybe they're listening to this podcast, would are starting to come around with the idea. If they listen to me anytime at all, they know that I say, you can do it. You can do it. But what are some first steps to doing it? Uh, you got involved with homesteading and permaculture. And- yeah, I think figuring out, being proactive about what um, what animals are going to be getting at your garden is like the first thing to do. I always say like the first thing you need is to figure out what kind of fence you need. Okay. Um, because like groundhogs, for example, love to wait until everything is nice and ripe. Right. It's not like bunnies. Bunnies will mow down your seedlings. And then, you know, it is what it is. Like groundhogs wait until that broccoli is beautiful. And you're like, oh, man, I'm I'm dealing with some groundhogs right now. That's crazy. I got a couple moved into my yard and it's been Mm -hmm. a challenge. Yeah. And they're a challenge. And they're, you know, the the Elmer Fudd approach does not work because they've created a really good home. And then a new one just moves right in so that. Mm. You just need a good fence. And um, I like to border um, any growing space with like gross tasting things to animals. So garlic and chives and daffodils and shallots and onions and, you know, just really try to use that first layer of defense Mm -hmm. as much as possible. Um, And then in terms of growing in a small space, I think look at what your family eats. Right. Yes. And that's going to be the first place. And if you're excited to grow it, you will take care of it. Yeah. yeah. And I know this firsthand because I always try a bunch of crops. And sometimes I'm like, well, I don't really like okra, but I grow okra and it does terrible. And I don't know why it does terrible. It's because if I have 10 minutes to water the garden, because I have 10 minutes out there, like I'm going to put the water on the crops that I care about. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I grow a few things I don't really particularly like that much. And I grow them because they're easy to grow and they grow well here. And it's like, oh, I'll just, I'll put in a few things and then they end up just sitting there and then I never eat them, you know? Yeah, exactly. And then I think the other big thing is like, don't be too precious about your harvest, right? I think a ton of people are like, I can't pick that kohlrabi. It's so beautiful in the garden. Look at how it looks. It's like, no, no, it's there to be eaten. Yeah. So wait and till then you it taste it. Space for more food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you like uh, do any succession planting or anything like that? I do. You- yeah. I do a ton of succession planting and mm-hmm. looking at layers for sure. Like what can I grow up? What can I grow around it? Um, one of the things I do is I will like, for example, if I have plants that start off small, because again, like I started growing in just 16 by 16. So I put my tomatoes in and then around the tomatoes would be spinach and lettuce and cilantro. And then as those tomatoes grew, I would be harvesting all of those other crops. So by the time, the, like, mm-hmm. I, I think it's like subletting the area, right? Like you're subletting. And so the, t- when the tomatoes are big and it's no longer lettuce season those lettuces are harvested or bolted and the the space is freed up so you can you can can get a couple a couple successions of crops in one area yeah now do you in your time consulting with individuals on their homesteads did you ever run to people who didn't have a yard at all maybe they were just doing using planters and growing stuff in a driveway and pots or something like that did you ever encounter that i definitely have people like i went to um uh it was a communal living home like house in um somerville massachusetts which is like Mm -hmm. essentially boston for people that aren't familiar it's like right in there it's um attached to cambridge and they had yeah, just pots. They were just yeah. growing with pots and it was it was an interesting kind of so there was a couple of folks that were a little bit older and then a couple of folks that were kind of younger and they all lived in one big house and took care, you know, like they paid different amounts depending on what they were doing and they helped out mm-hmm. different amounts depending on their ability. And so um yeah, so that just like getting them to understand, you know, where they could put the pots and like how they can still make because that area was they also used for like group meals and things like that. So mm-hmm. yeah. And they, you know, turning them onto grow bags, I think was a game changer. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing though what you can do, even without a yard at all. I mean, if you got some sunlight and place you can set some stuff, I mean, even it's it's doable. Uh, totally. I've not think, consulted with anyone that's like strictly hydroponic or anything like that. Cause I, I don't actually know too, too much about that, but yeah, yeah, it's amazing what you can do with just a couple containers. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I grow, even though I have a pretty large garden, I still plop big pots of whatever around and I grow veggies. And like, I'll, uh, this year I had some, I think they're about six gallon planters that I put and I put some, I stuck some bamboo poles in them and grew some uh, pole beans in them and, and right in a pot, you know, and I just had them sitting in different spots around the yard along my sidewalk, going out to my garage and stuff because, you know, I'm a homesteader. I, I, I never have enough going on. So I always have to have right, a little bit add more. more and more, right? <laughs> Especially if you have the seeds for it. That's right. I know I keep my herbs pretty close in containers, even though I have them in the, I put herbs in all my beds for various, you know, keeping away cucumber beetles and all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. But like, I also have a bunch of herbs right in the, in the back area because when I'm cooking, I want to be able to just run out and clip some herbs. I don't want to have to go Mm -hmm. all the way. And, you know, it's not that far, but when you have the stove on, you have a four-year-old running around, like you, you want it to be as short a time out as possible. So, you know, I keep herbs. I kind of think about, um, in permaculture, you have like your zones of use. Right. And so in that first zone, typically if you were a large homestead, that first zone would be like you know your house and the first like 500 yards around it and like for me it's actually like my my zone one is my porch (laughs) yeah yeah so yeah and i think that's one of the things when we talk about like permaculture at a smaller scale like you just have to look at those those zones still exist they're just smaller oh and it doesn't even necessarily have to be the closest place to you like there's i have an actual little herb garden beside my house that's kind of like uh, on the south side of my house it, it, but it's it's funny but when i walk out the door i tend to walk out a gate that goes over to where my larger garden is so mm-hmm. it's i don't tend to go up in that section where the herb garden is as it isn't my natural flow to go that way mm-hmm. so it's actually a you know a further zone even though it's closer to my house because it's not where i would go most often so i find that it's actually the place that's a little bit further away that's in my natural flow of where i walk that's the actual zone one which yeah, is that's kind sort of how so. i feel about where my apple trees are right i was like yeah. hey i don't love i don't know what it is but like, i don't love gardening in the front yard i feel like yeah. sort of like out on display like whatever it is but like i like being in the back but i have a couple of fruit trees in the front and i have them for a couple of reasons one is like that's where the good sun is mm-hmm. so it is what it is um but also i kind of like the idea of have like we're in apple country and i kind of like the idea of like the the the, the foundation landscape pieces being edible or yeah. edible landscaping and yeah well now okay you mentioned apple trees a few times uh do you have any you're not using any kind of sprays or anything on your trees right i use copper fungicide and okay oil. more natural oil. stuff though yeah. so you're you're able to grow good apples and without any trouble by using just that can you ask me in a couple of years <laughs> <laughs> um we have a deer problem and so i okay. started moving some of the yeah so that's part of the reason why i was planting that orchard in the back is because i you know i've tried various things where i use like um an organic spray with like cayenne pepper and i put mm-hmm. them on the lead i put it on the new growth and like it doesn't matter if it's the new growth the buds the flowers the the fruit like the deer get them eventually yeah. And what's I don't the really uh, want, yeah. What's the uh, clay? Uh, what's it called? The oh, clay? paneling clay. Yeah, you can spray on. The, I mean, I've heard that that they bite that. They don't like the taste of it. Oh, interesting. I've heard it's better for. I haven't insects. heard that. But that's, yeah. yeah, for insects and stuff. But, but I think it, uh, some larger animals too deer, don't like yeah. to get that taste in their mouth and don't want. You know, so it might be something. I to might try. try that this year. I bought yeah. some paneling clay for to try um, to thwart squash vine bore. I didn't mm. get around to actually using it, so I still have it. Yeah, might give that a try. I don't know. I mean, it's not something I know either. I don't really have deer pressure where I live. Uh, we have raccoons and po- mm-hmm. you know possums and groundhogs and squirrels. Do the possums and do other than like a problem for the chickens? Do the possums do damage? Uh, no, not really. They get in the compost and mess mm, it up yeah. a little bit. But other than that, they don't really. Uh, they well, they. Uh, I did have some where my i kept my quail and they broke into that area and was trying to get into a cage they didn't succeed but they they yeah. were in there um but yeah i mean I, they'll, they'll cause little issues like that but uh we have everything but bears and according to the guy at the chicken feed store it's just a matter of years before we have bears really Black bears. yeah we have fisher cat or fishers rather we mm-hmm. have um deer raccoon weasels possum everything fox yeah um coyotes 
And like our coyotes are huge out here. Hmm. It's mostly an issue for the hawks. I'd say the chickens are the most susceptible, but yeah, definitely. We have um, all of our fences go, including the chicken coop, go out 12 inches. So they all have, or 12 to 18 inches, they have what's called like a predator skirt. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be keeping things away. I think it's only a matter of time till the the groundhog figure it out though. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely when you're dealing with, especially with your chickens and stuff, you definitely have to be paying attention to the predators and stuff because they could they clean you out pretty quick. I mean, yeah, especially with only eight chickens. Yeah, they could they could definitely do some damage. I had a lady on one time on the podcast, and I can't remember where she was uh, uh, way up north in Canada, I think, and, and mm-hmm. uh, she lost a hundred chickens in one night. Uh, yeah, Coy- coyotes, I believe it was. Coyotes, yeah. yeah, yeah, if I remember right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was thinking, wow, what a hit! I mean, that's that's amazing. Like all of her chickens, like a hundred chickens, it was all. Yeah, of them, and though. then like even, and I've had friends that have had predator attacks, and then the ones that remain just stop laying forever. Mm, just just stressed them out, huh? Stressed them out, and then they stopped, and I like, you know, our our chicken. I you know, I'm not cuddling my chickens. I'm not putting a diaper and bringing them inside, but they are. <laughs> Pets. Like I, they definitely think that like I will yeah. let them live out their henna paws life and <laughs> stop laying. <laughs> um, so I'd like to keep them safe, even yeah. if they are not. You know, they well, still do a great job giving me. Do you? Compost. Do you? Um, you have chickens now. Do you ever? I mean, you free range them a little bit. I think right. Supervised free range. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if you kept any, like would move them in tractors at all around your property or anything like that. I don't, I like have plans. I have like, I have one run that is like a portable run. And sometimes I'll put a couple chickens in and put them over a bed for a couple hours or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. But I don't have like a big tractor because yeah. it just, the, it doesn't work out for the ergonomics of the yard. Yeah. Yeah. I've done it. I've been doing it around here with quail and they don't really tear stuff up, but you know, they're mm-hmm. putting their, nutrients in the places i want it which is nice and and that works works real well um i didn't it's know if you were doing cool. that with your chickens or not i know i mean i look at people like justin rhodes who he does a whole oh know, yeah he's moving show on it right. use he puts them to work i mean he basically uses them to do his entire garden for him right and <laughs> the, his pigs do it too right pigs like, also like, yeah yeah cool. so i mean you can definitely put your animals to work if you want to use them that way or you can just you know let them be pets and that's let fine them, yeah, too like nothing wrong with that between, right i do let them like this time of year especially um now it's frosted and there's just a bunch of like mushy tomatoes on the ground i do let them get in the garden more mm-hmm. but they're actually not as safe in my garden because they don't have a ton of coverage yeah okay so like yeah. was it last year maybe the year before i had like a very juvenile hawk swoop mm-hmm. in it very yeah. quickly realized it was a lot smaller than the chicken it was going after so it went back up but it was just sitting on top of the yeah the post and when you don't have a rooster that yeah that definitely the danger is a lot more present i yeah. have a dog and yeah he sort of helps he watches over him huh yeah i mean you know so he's not like a guardian livestock dog he's a labradoodle he's a mini labradoodle mm-hmm. um but he's so he other than the fact that he goes into the coop and they don't like that <laughs> um because he loves chicken poop um He's really good at keeping an eye out for them, I have to my, say. My daughter has one of those, and that is one of the best dogs I've ever seen. It's just, it's a great dog. He's the best. Like, yeah. he's just, other than the fact that he ate half a loaf of sourdough yesterday. Um, yeah, I seen that on Instagram. <laughs> I was heartbroken. I was laughing. I was like, oh my gosh. Cause so I, I baked a sourdough loaf and I tagged Tartan Bakery because that's the recipe I use. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Tartan Bakery, but it's like they are like the godfather of sourdough. <laughs> and um, I was joking. I was like, oh, my God, that loaf of bread like was was reta- was reposted by Tartan Bakery and Walter just ate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've seen you like to shame your dog yeah, on Instagram. I <laughs> didn't care. He's, you know. He was like, yeah, I ate it. You left it. You guys left me. He's such a pandemic puppy now, right? Because he's used to someone being home all the time. <laughs> so we went to friends' houses to go trick-or-treating, came back, and half the bread was gone. Yeah, my daughter and her husband and, and their little baby daughter all went to Italy for uh, a few days uh, for a couple of weeks. And we kept uh, their dog for him here for the last couple of weeks. And uh, he, she was fantastic. She was a great dog. I mean, you just didn't They're have to so worry about easy. her getting out and doing things. She just minded so well. Yeah, they're smart. Dogs. I mean, like for the most part, he I mean, he'll eat like carbs and meat, but like 
you know, he's pretty good about not eating things he shouldn't, even when he was a little puppy. I never had any of those, yeah. like, he ate a golf tea or whatever stories. But like Dogs are going to be dogs. <laughs> it's like kids yeah. are going to be kids. <laughs> they totally, do things. totally. <laughs> but, yeah, no, he's he's been a good dog, I have to say. He's been a good farm dog, other than the fact that, you know, he eats the chicken poop, and they don't like that. But <laughs> Wait, Dogs are great to have on a homestead. Yeah, all dogs, like I said, I mean, even for protection, we have always had little dogs and stuff. And even they were, were just great at letting us know when there's a problem around there. I mean, if they're not going to go attack something, they'll let you know something's there, you know, and things totally. like that. Yeah, I feel a lot safer yeah. at home knowing that he's here. Even just like, you know, he's uh, he's obviously not vicious. He's um, he, We joke that he looks like a chicken nugget. But... <laughs> Um, you know, he's going to bark. He's going to keep someone away and, and the animals away too. Like he's, he's pretty good about that. Um, yeah. he'll chase off a deer or something even. Yeah. So you deer, opportunity. fox, yeah. he keeps foxes away. Mm-hmm. Um, he'll definitely, and he's, you know, he'll, it's funny if I'm rounding the chickens up to get them back in, he will start like hurting. He'll start <laughs> doing the same thing. So <laughs> that's funny. Well, he sounds like you're doing quite a bit. You got a lot going on. What's your plans for the future on your home? So you're going to change anything? You feel like you're you're complete? <laughs> or there's no, I definitely don't feel like okay. I'm complete, right? I think I can always optimize. I don't know if I'm going to add, mm-hmm. but I'm always looking to optimize. So um, irrigation situation definitely could use some tweaking. Mm-hmm. Um, I am trying out a different system in part of one of the beds, and I'm not getting quite enough pressure at the back. So I'd like to kind of figure that out. Um, next year, that's a big one. I think I might expand the chicken operation a little since we're mm-hmm. get, getting kind of light on eggs. As I mentioned, they're starting to go into henna paws. And um, I think at some point I said, like, I want the kids to be old enough for it to be kind of their thing, but I'd like to get mm-hmm. bees. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, and then just in ter- just really, it's really at, at this point, I think a lot about optimizing the space and optimizing my systems. So making yeah. sure that. Like I'm not wasting money on things or wasting resources on them and just trying to figure out what's working, what's made the most improvement and what's really not, not worth my time. That's what's great about permaculture too. A lot of times when the system matures, um, it actually requires less work and, uh, and it actually produces more as it matures. So, I mean, it's uh, permaculture is great for that. I mean, it, 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 and you can optimize that and even make it better, but it tends to do better the older it is, the more established it is. Totally. I think at some point, you know, I do want to move those those fruit trees, but I think at some point the deer pressure won't really matter as much because the trees will be bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, right now I have like four or five budding branches. And so if they get those done, but like in five years when they're big mature, if they get it will be much better. I'll still get some apples. Yeah. Well, that's important. You don't want to just I mean, we love we love nature, but we don't want to take all of our food. (laughs) <laughs> no, and I think that's yeah, that's exactly. And I um I think that I may be able to reroute them. That's the other thing that I'm thinking because deer have like very distinct paths they move on. Mm-hmm. And those apple trees had I I think this is like a total like I was really eager to get my fruit trees in. I it was the, the first year I bought the house. I said I gotta get the fruit trees in, those take the longest to mature, which I still think is a good idea. But mm-hmm. I didn't take a whole season to really be with my yard and understand what's coming through and how the water moves, where the animals are and where the sun is and um, where the sun isn't, especially in the fall, you know, the angle of the sun changes so much. And so I'm still sort of, now I have a much better understanding of that. And now I'm just trying to figure out what's the best way to work with all of that. Yeah. That observation of your property is really important in permaculture. And there's a big emphasis put on that when, when you study permaculture, but just sit for a while and understand your zones, understand your sectors, just observe it and see what it's doing. And then, then design, you know, so it, yeah, you're right. That's a good, uh, it's a good thing to, to know going in. So, yeah. Yeah. I think I always say like, give, wait, wait a year, mm-hmm. you know, do your, do your annual veggie thing, but like wait a year, really figure out yeah. what things are going on. And especially before you invest, I like, I feel pretty good about the fact that I bought bare root trees. So like, even if they're getting munched on, they're only, you know. Yeah. $30 a pop. They weren't yeah. a couple hundred bucks like some of the more. Right. Yeah. Like the Espalier multi variety grafted pear trees I bought this year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You can dump some money and stuff. I mean, that's the thing. Homesteading can be really expensive, or you can do things on the cheap. You can learn how to graft and, and stuff and do your own thing, or you can, you know, 
deal with local nurseries and buy stuff that's a little cheaper. I mean, there's there's ways to make it cheaper, but you can definitely spend a lot of money. You definitely <laughs> spend a lot of money, especially like if you look on Instagram and you see all those gorgeous, gorgeous gardens that pop up overnight yep. and things like that. Yeah. I just, um, I love cut flowers. And one of the things that like, I, I feel like my love for cut flowers has been growing every year. It used to be like, if I can't eat it, why would I grow it? Right. If mm. I can't eat it and it's not serving a purpose in terms of like bringing more pollinators in or something, why would I grow it? Now I'm like, I really enjoy putting together bouquets for friends and like giving that, like, it's like yeah. one of my favorite things is just to be like, Hey, heard you had a hard week. I'm leaving a Mason jar bouquet on your doorstep. And, yeah. um, or just take a stroll around your property and enjoy them. There's nothing wrong with right. that either. Yeah. There's a that's, health aspect to that. That's just, you know, it well, ain't all about what you're putting in your body. It's about just being around it. I think too. Right. And yeah. And just seeing like all the butterflies and everything. It's mm-hmm. just so amazing. So anyway, so I was buying a bunch of Dahlia tubers and they cost a fortune. It's ridiculous. And then last year I was like, I'm going to try some Dahlias from seed. I bought like a $6 packet of seed and I grew out and I had, you know, now I have like tons and tons of Dahlia tubers to save from those seeds. And it's, it's so satisfying. And it was, it cost me $6 versus if you're not familiar with Dahlia growing tubers can cost anywhere from five to $25. You know, you can, you can, the other thing is I will, I love collecting different varieties of seeds, but I also like, I'm perfectly happy to like take a walk through a park and like grab a seed head off and bring it home and grow it out. And Takes more time, but you know, it doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg. Yeah. There's totally the plan has been generating these things and moving them around since the beginning. And, you know, we can just help it along into our yard if we want to. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's like one of the things that I've, I've learned is you can, you know, you can also spend a ton on fertilizer or you can yeah. just take some worm stuff and brew it, which I'm next year. I'm hoping to do. I bought all the equipment before I didn't get around to it this year. Oh, you're doing a worm, like a worm for like just starting to do just vermicomposting. Vermicomp. Yeah. So I yeah. have, a, I have a worm bin, um, sub pod sent me a worm bin and I've been enjoying that a lot. I have to say like, that has mm-hmm. been really interesting to see how fast they go through oh, yeah. the waste. It's yeah. an unbelievable. Yeah, I've got one that I built a couple of years ago, and it is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, they can go through it real quick. And then also just the um, the worm castings, doing some brood worm tea. I'm excited to experiment mm-hmm. with that next year. Yeah, that'll do some amazing things for your garden. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're doing a lot of great stuff. Uh, and I know people will just uh, be really interested to see some of this, what you're doing. Cause you got some great stuff on Instagram. I was just going through just uh, yesterday. I was scrolling through your Instagram. Just kind of looking <laughs> at things. You got some, you're doing some amazing things. You really are. And, and uh, yeah, you, you're I, a good teacher. You're just a really good teacher. You're explaining things and showing things of what's going on. And I, I love that. So I'm going to encourage people to go to your, for your Instagram, for sure. Uh, Acton food for us. Yep. And I'll have a link in the show notes for that. Is there any other place you'd want to send people? Um, I'm most active on Instagram. I, because I don't have a ton of time. I don't, I'm not on TikTok really. And I don't really pay too much attention to Facebook. Um, so yeah, Instagram is definitely the best way to, to reach me. And, um, I would say, make sure you're following my stories because Mm -hmm. I don't post on my feed nearly as much as I put on my stories. I think it's just a more natural format to, for me to interact with people. Um, so oftentimes that's where I'm really doing the most is just a quick update of what's going on. And, um, it's mostly garden related, but there's definitely some things like my dog ate my sourdough or look, my kid dressed up as sushi. Yeah, that's, that's homesteading. As far as I'm concerned, that's all homesteading. <laughs> that's yeah. Real, and I think, life. you know, as, as the winter, uh, as the winter comes on, I have my like pile of mending and stuff like that. So I'm always kind of yeah. Looking so that's stuff. what winter homesteading looks like to you. You're going in the house and you're taking care of those. Um, and cold dipping, obviously. Now. Oh, yeah. We, we didn't even get that. into that. You did that right before the podcast uh, here <laughs> interview tonight. Yeah. You went, jumped in some cold water. Yeah. You can have all that you want. I'm not interested. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's got to, I mean, I have heard good things about it, but I just don't know if I can handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's, well, that's the whole point, right? Is like that it's hard. That's why you do it. But, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I was talking with uh, the other woman that I I went into the water with today, and I said, you know, we're gonna have to like carve ice out of this thing in this in the winter. 
Oh man. I have, I know a guy and he's, he's probably 15 years older than me. I'm in my fifties and, and he's in this, you know, a, a local polar bear club and they go mm-hmm. out in the dead of winter and, and jump in and stuff. And I'm like, you are nuts. <laughs> my dad has been doing it every year. He yeah. loves it. It's like, you know, I grew up in Rhode Island and there's a big, you know, I think anywhere near an ocean, there's always, there's always a couple crazy folk who love to go in the cold water. <laughs> I got to say, you know, there's some things I'm just open-minded about. I'm interested in. There's some things I'm going, nah. You got to try it one time. You got to try it one time before you say you don't want it. I mean, I've had to, I've had to go in cold water to do something before, you know, drag a deer that ran into the water or something at the pole, something like that, you know, and that's not even fun. So it's like, okay, I don't know. I don't think. Yeah, no, that definitely, that's, well, that's, Yeah. I guess then you've tried it. You didn't have the same mindset, I guess. It's yeah, just, I wasn't doing it because I thought it was going to benefit to get your my body in some way. To, uh, yeah. I, you know, you're right. You're probably, I've heard people do this, do the, the cold shower thing where they just turn it, you know, for 10 minutes in a cold shower no, or something. See, I can't do that. I can't man. even do, you know, supposedly if you rinse your hair in cold water for even like 10 seconds, it's supposed to be really good. I still can't even do that. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Hey, if it works, I'm not going to knock yeah. it. Yeah. It, it. Takes all, it all takes all sorts of folks. And that's one of the things that like, I think with permaculture, right. Is like, you get to hear, you get to see such a wide variety of people, mm-hmm. you know, you have people who are like living off grid in like yeah. Costa Rica and you have people it's... who are in the Appalachian mountains and, you know, and everything in between. And it's just super cool to see how everyone's taking the same principles and applying it to their life in different ways. Yeah. It's so different for everyone. And, and I do, I'll talk to, I mean, I've had people on this show and I've had people, you know, up down in, up in Canada, I've had people over in the desert, you know, you down in Florida and they're just in these completely different environments and homesteading looks completely different in all those places. Totally. And, and even, and then you got their different, reasons that they do it and and everything so it's just it it's amazing the the variety you get uh in homesteading and i do appreciate that too and in permaculture too i mean it's just it's all works together and and, um especially in today's world anything that can bring people with different views together and to see that like we're all humans is just Mm -hmm. so so important because everyone like i think we're all starting to kind of lose sight of that i agree that's good that's good well anything you want to leave folks with before you before you go um no i think i think uh i think covered a lot of it i really enjoyed talking with you and um honestly like if you told me five years ago i would have been on this podcast i would have never believed you because <laughs> i would say the so, so i definitely picked up a few books you know on permaculture but a lot of my knowledge came from just driving on 95 to work listening to your podcast so oh come on That's now a, no it's true i <laughs> we, like we've had some great guests on that have been i've learned a ton from some of the guests we've had over the years for sure i mean uh some of the things i'm doing is because i learned from people that i've had on the show and you know i and and now it sounds like you're doing as much or more in some areas than i'm doing yeah i think i got half know, the reason i got my things. instagram account was because i think my friends were sick of hearing it. And I was like, well, there must be people that want to hear about it. And I did find them. So. They're out there. It's amazing. I know They're when I started this there. podcast all them years ago, I thought, I don't know who will listen to it, but there might be 10 or 15 people somewhere. I didn't know it was going to be thousands. <laughs> no. And you know, it's so amazing. I think that's one of the things like, you know, when you, you are in an area where you're like, well, everyone has, you know, everyone has the 2.5 kids and everyone has the hydrangeas in the front yard. And then you're like, Oh, not everyone. Some people have hydrangeas in their front yard. And then like, chickens and tree you know and like yeah. a whole different world in the backyard or their yeah. front yard too but yeah i, um, I drive I've, around i've met a lot of people through instagram that are local which has been really cool because i don't think i would have found that through my like pto circles or whatever so i drive around now and if i see a small hobby greenhouse or a garden in somebody's backyard i'm like stopping the car and going up and introducing myself i would have never done that a few years ago now i'm like i want to know who you are i want to know i know there's a house that just sold in my town and it's this like amazing pink victorian that i had like real heartache about i was like i have no reason to move but this house is just amazing and um I was like, whoever buys it, I have to be friends with. They're so cool. Like, you know, they have a really cool, it had a pink barn too. It had a big pink barn. And then I drove by the other day and they put it in an orchard. And I was like, now I really need to like somehow yeah. meet these people because they're 
they're my kind of people. Yeah. Sounds like your, your, your clan there. You need to, you need to make contact for sure. That's how I feel too. It's like, I see that and I'm like, oh, they surely they, they, we're on the same page here. Yeah. You wanted a pink barn and you're putting an orchard in. We have to be friends. You found your people. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your story you. and, uh, and, and being an inspiration for folks. It's, uh, I think, uh, it'll be beneficial to folks who are in situations like yours and mine who, don't have a lot of land and want to get started. So I appreciate you uh, playing a part in that. Yeah, no, thank you. I just, yeah, I think it's one of those things that you got to live. You don't get a lot of land if you need to live somewhere close to a lot of jobs. And so you got to work with what you have and, um, you know, particularly like the Boston area and that area, you know, it's, you don't get a lot of land unless you go pretty far out. And then I didn't want to lose a lot of my day commuting. So it's, it's worked out well. Awesome. Yeah. A lot of people in that situation. So thanks for being an inspiration for them. Well, great stuff. Thank you, Jess, uh, for coming on. That's Jess at Acton Food Force. Go check out her Instagram. I know you enjoyed that and got a lot from that, especially if you're on a small piece of property. There was a lot of good nuggets in there of of helpful information and uh, just encouragement. So uh, yeah, go check her out on Instagram and be further encouraged. And until next time, folks, uh, happy homesteading and God bless. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race, I want to flee. My world, I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. Grandma did sitting on her front porch, hunting and fishing like a kid. Once you've done all of your chores, it's a modern homestead. Build a modern homestead. Country or city, there's a way to make this change. You got. Today.